And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are back once again with another class in Heavens and Heresies. This time around, we are doing the Inqu we are doing the Inquisitor. I am going to do my absolute best to not make any references to a certain to a certain British show that had John Cleese. I'm not going to do I'm not going to do ver a very good job at it, but I'm going to try. Doesn't mean I'm going to succeed. And Zan, you are <laughs> just, you are concerningly quiet. Hiding my time. Yeah. <laughs> so, I do have to, I do have to I do have to issue a couple corrections from last week. The first one is the fact that I had said that I couldn't think of any classes that were that um got their subclass at, right out of the gate. That is that is not the case. The the um the sorcerer and the warlock both get their subclasses at le at first level. So my bad. At the same time, though, the fact that the f that the fact that some the fact that it's hard to tell the consistency on w on on when you get your subclass depending on the class you pick is so is something worth noting. Mm -hmm. Especially since especially since some um, I'm pl I am I'm writing I'm writing a script that I plan to codify all of the major problems I have with D and D D fifth edition from a design perspective. And one of the one of the things that I do one of the things that I do want to bring up is the reliance on subclasses. Especially okay. when it, especially when it comes to when it comes to certain when it comes to certain archetypes that really should be their own class but have to be forced into fit into fitting in the framework of a class that they should that they shouldn't be for. Um I'd say one of the big examples of this kind of thing is the blade singer. And I would I would say the and I was going to say the hexblade but the hexblade is the hexblade I don't have as much of an issue with gi given given the stuff that you already have with with warlock as it is. Yeah. But the blade singer I find far more egregious, sim simply because of the fact that the whole concept of the blade singer is your, is your gish, you know, someone who someone who can cast spells and sw and swing a sword. But because of because of the fact, but because of the fact that they have to be in the template of a very glassy class in the form of wizards. They're not a, they're not really able to fulfill that fan, that fantasy of a gish. And I bring that I bring that one up in particular here because that's the major theme with the Inquisitor. I had thought initially that the Inquisitor was going to be um, was go, was was going to be this was going to be this game's answer to the cleric. That is not the case. And I think I think and I and looking at the classes to come. Um, there's only, there's maybe one that would probably, that would probably fit in that category, and even that, and even that's a stretch. And I get the feeling that the reason, that the reason why we're not having a cleric equivalent class in, he in Heavens and Heresies is the fact, is the fact that, um, cl that cleric has certain connotations that this game Seems to want to avoid. Yeah. Chief chief among them being the being the religious religious ties angle. When a when a cleric is when a cleric is just an occupation. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the when it, com when it comes to the inquis when it comes to the inquisitor itself. I was initially going to bring up the Inquisitor from Pathfinder, but I get I get the feeling that's 
that's not. But I get the feeling that that's not going to be apropos, especially since the Inqui the Pathfinder Inquisitor, as it was laid out in the Advanced Player's Guide, is is one of those is one of those weird ass kit bashes that pa that Pathfinder has a habit of do habit of doing at the time. It's considered a tier three class. It has a bunch of decent abilities, but they don't synerg they don't synergize properly compared to other classes. I mean, it ha and the sweet the sweet irony of the Inquisitor, it's meant to be a get it's meant to be a gish class with so with some with some mixing of elements between bards and clerics. And yet, the better the better way to build an Inquisitor is to is to not focus on casting, to take an Inquisition instead of taking a cleric domain because they can take cleric domains, but they don't get bonus spells from it, which is weird. But in yeah, but instead instead I want instead I want to talk a bit about the concept of a gish. Now, I've seen so, I've seen some argue that the the concept alone, which I do think I do think we need before we even get into it, we need to nail down what we mean by gish for those for the for the um, Goku's in the room. Eh. Gish, in short in shorthand, is an is an archetype for the for those kind of characters that are decently proficient in. In regular combat and spell casting, whether that be arcane, divine, primal, what have you, just a bit of fighty and a bit of casty. If you need a video game example, red mages and magic knights, I think I think would I think would fit the um, gishy category. Paladins and dark knights sometimes, depending on the game in question. Yeah. Um. I'd say I'd say. I was I was gonna bring up some of the classes in Diablo 2, but not ri not really. They they have a Diablo 2 has a pretty has a pretty clear line between the martial and the casting classes. And say the on, the only one I could think the only one that I think of would that would apply is the paladin with their with their use of auras. And even that is me kind of stretching things. Kind of stretching things. Only a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not quite breaking definitions yet, but, but dangerously close. Yeah. Now, the problem that ends up the, one of the or, now the term comes from um Geth, comes from Githyanki, which when they were introduced that was that was one of their big archetypes. Um, uh, but I would say I would say one of the earliest examples of the Gish were were um. Race as class elves in old school D and D. At least, at least Gish is in terms of in terms of um, tabletop history. Obviously, it's a lot easier to do a Gish archetype in video games than it is in tabletop. Mm -hmm. But part of the part of the problem that ends up ari that ends up arising with the Gish class is the, is the problem that arises whenever you have a character that can fill multiple roles when. The, when the idea of class design is everybody's good at this one specific field. So when you have somebody who's only moderately good in, in a couple things, it's very easy for them to get completely dusted. This is the pro this is the problem that we've talked about in the past with the ranger and early versions of the bard. The bard got away with it by being able to find its own niche with the whole diplomancer thing. The ranger, yeah. mm, not so much. And the and because of because of the because of druids getting wild shape, the uh, the argument has always been: well, if the rain if the ranger can do can do fighty and cast druid spells, why not just pick a druid? Then take then take wild sh then do a wild shape and c casting build so that you can cast while while you're in, while you're in the form of a big fucking bear. <laughs> and because because of that, druid because of that um gishes. And Gish archetypes, much like, much like, the, much like those other multi-role approaches, have the drawbacks of both, but not strong enough benefits of of either, unless they ha unless, unless they're able to fall within a niche that the that the core that those core um, fields that they're drawing from don't fulfill. That's that's why that's why I bring up the Bard as the as the exception to this kind of rule. 
And when it comes to fighting and casting type gishes, you ha you end up having two extremes. Either they're way way overpowered, like the like the old school elf or the cleric, mm -hmm. or the or they're ridiculously underpowered. I e or the, or you have a case where they're able to do they're able to do something good, but other classes can outshine them easily. Yeah. Um, I'd say if I need to use a 5e example, the Eldritch Knight Fighter, which I don't, which, at least in my experience, at least in my experience GMing, not a whole lot of people pick out, not a whole lot of people pick, um, Eldritch Knight. If anything, I'd say, I'd say the more, co I'd say the more common, um, subclass for fighter that gets picked is the, is the, um, Battlemaster. Uh -huh. Especially with some of the expanded maneuvers that it's gotten over the years, but the but that fa that fantasy of a of a gish requires requires several levels and is probably the probably the truest system mastery class simply because trying to build a proper gish has a whole lot of traps, and if you make the if you make the wrong move and you don't properly optimize. You're gonna be. You're going to be once again dusted by the re by the rest of your by the rest of your party. Now, as an as getting in getting into the Inquisitor archetype, what I do find kind of funny is we've known for the longest time Inquisitors have been depicted in fiction as as um as 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 being the, as being the person who points it's a witch and and setting the, and putting them to the torch except to the torch except um except in, a, in actuality Inqu inquisitors didn't didn't care didn't really care about witches they were <laughs> they were more they were more they were more concerned with with um with uh, with with un with unpopular faiths, but which but which is a case of what some some cra some crazy lady who's who who's doing who's doing rituals in the middle in the in the ass end of the forest, or is an herbalist that knows what herbs work and what don't for medicines or there's a lot of different re things that a witch is that people persecuted her for. Mm -hmm. Like in the twelfth century, their main target were Cathars. Mm-hmm. And usually, when usually when somebody was f was found guilty, they were they were handed over to secular authorities. So in that re in that regard, inquis inquisitors, if you should be should be should be more accurately perceived as um as divine lawmen, not at not as um not as the typical witch hunter. Yeah. Because that's what they were, they were they were sent from, you know, the, the seats of power at the time, the religious houses. And yes, the, yes, burning at the stake was a was a punishment that could be given, but there were other, but there were, but it's not like that was the only punishment. There were things like having to pay fines, having to recite prayers, having to do a pilgrimage, or going on house arrest. Being drawn and quartered, drowning in lakes and rivers. You're not exactly helping my case. <laughs> That's because in most cases, those lenient punishments were only induced if a witch was found innocent. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, you're not a witch, but clearly there was something bad about you that uh, drew God to you to bring justice to you and bring your heart back to piousness. So, while we're not going to kill you, here, you, you get to pay us some tithes. Or here, go do a pilgrimage. Or here, treat the lepers. Um, I do, th I do think, I do think it's kind of funny that I saw that I saw so I saw s that there were so many arguments about how witches and cunning folk are totally not the totally not the same thing. <laughs> no, not at all. Which is which, is some is some. But the the point the point is is that the 
the reason why the reason why I'm bringing that kind of thing up is that it's very it's very easy to play an inquisitor and do and do the whole point pointing pointing about uh, about how the, about how you're a witch you're a witch you're a witch but in but in all, but when you stop and when you stop and think about how 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 they should be done um it would be more accurate it would be more accurate to say that to say that they're um investigators more than anything else a proper Inquisitor is Johnny Depp's Ichabod Crane. Which, you can't uh, refute my logic. <laughs> no, no, I can't. But essentially, a proper Inquisitor, as the name implies, is supposed to be inquisitorial. They are supposed to ask about things and find out things. Searching the truth is to be an inquisitor. Mm -hmm. Now there aren't there aren't many games with an inquisitor class, per se, because mo most of the time people argue, well, it's just well, it's just a reskin of cleric because you know, the the quick and easy answer is to, is to just reskin what already exists. If it sounds like I'm accuse, accusing people accusing grogs who make that <laughs> argument of laziness, that's because I am. And in I'd and um the only the only real inc the only real um full on inquisitor class in any in a in any large instance is the is the one in Pathfinder specifically in the Pathfinder Advanced Players Guide. Mm -hmm. Who, as I mentioned, they're a tier three class. They're able to do think they're able to do a bunch of things decently, but it doesn't it doesn't synergize. Also, their spell list sucks. As we've seen with previous spellcasters in Heavens and Heresies, however, a spell list, quote unquote, sucking, isn't a thing. You would have to actively try to sap. If what we've seen is any indication, you would have to outright commit sabotage in order to, have... <laughs> in order to have a spell list suck. You'd have to pick spells that don't do anything for your character, which, considering there are only 15 total, is hard enough. And then you'd just have to, like, ignore the fact that secondary effects exist. That's the only way your spell list could suck. And, that, and at that point, you're trying to suck. Mm -hmm. but, with the, but with that said, let's get, let's get into Heavens and Heresy's take on the Inquisitor. I read that opening blurb just now, and I'm going to have fun with this uh, this blurb. I'm afraid. <clears throat> no, no, I'm going to do it proper. Trust me. I don't always bane you, just when it's most opportune. <clears throat> so, you just happened upon this particular inn, is that right? I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that the daughter of the Enthian Pontifex just happens to be staying at this specific inn on this specific night. I'm curious as to how you came by that information, by the way. It was well guarded. Now, I wouldn't suggest running. In fact, I insist. Come forth. You know, your eyes flashed to that hidden dagger you carry right as I approached. It gave you away, in case you were wondering. Well, that, and you were a fool to think you could hide your reputation. Who do you think I am? Because I know who you are. Assassin of Westport, Grey Dagger of the Guild. You have entered my city and threatened my guests. I invoke my right as an arbiter. Now hear my judgment. Death. Draw your blade, assassin. Favian Laughingsteel, human arbiter. <laughs> Hearing that, why do I why do I keep flashing back to thief? <laughs> I don't know. Although I d I doubt that. Although this per although I'd say Favian here is not nearly as um stuck as stuck up as the Hammerites. This is probably very true. Nor was Garrett a, a uh, an assassin. Nope. 
Well, ar- argu- arguably in the remake, but we don't fucking talk about that. Ever. The what? Exactly. <laughs> but... There's... But that's... I should I should note that le- I should note that <laughs> I was I always get a kick out of compound names because sometimes you get good stuff and sometimes you get interesting things. I'd say Laughing Steel is a pretty good compound name. Yeah. Good choice, Tanner. Always appreciate it. So, the core ab- the core ability requirements is either strength and dexterity and intuition. Which is your, which is going to be your spell casting ability for Inquisitor spells, your magic of understanding drawn on drawn on those you are trained to hunt. You use your intuition whenever a spell refers to your spell casting ability. In addition, you use your intuition modifier when making an attack roll with a spell you cast or skill attack you use. And we have a dev note. A small note on about intuition classes. Because intuition determines the number of magical items to which you may attune. We'll probably get into that later. Intuition-based classes are able to attune to more magical items, making them more adaptable and better suited to the treasures you find during play. This was intentional for all of, for all of the intuition classes: Disciple, Druid, Herald, and Inquisitor. Any class, of course, may choose Intuition as a core ability if they also want to attune more magical items. But since their highest stats are required to be in the class ability requirements. They will not generally have as much intuition as the intuition classes themselves. Just a fun little complexity for the balance of this game. As a secondary note, after playtesting the magic items, intuition no longer gives a bonus to initiative rolls, meaning initiative is back is back to being based off of wits. Yay. So uh, <clears throat> something I do have to point out about those intuition classes. Two of them are the two casters we've covered, the Druid and the Herald, which was the answer for the Bard. Um... Disciple is a martial class. Disciple being able to attune to a lot of magical items suddenly makes those uh those plate mail wearing crossbow monks that we kept talking about even scarier. <laughs> yeah, because My cross- now you can give them magic plate mail. Or magic crossbows that never run out of quarrels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't think. It, I don't know if that's an actual magical item, but just imagine possibilities. Um, <coughs> why am I? Why am I thinking? Of, why am I thinking of the repeating crossbow from Van Helsing? I was thinking more the repeating crossbow on Guts's arm, but that works too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of them. One of them is trying. Is is a case of saying. How can I make a mach- how can I make a machine gun without actually having a machine gun? Um, whereas the crossbow that Guts has, I think that I think it's operated by a crank. It is on his arm. So it's a it's a miniaturized puckle gun. Iron well, not ironic a coincidence, considering that he runs around with an elf named Puck. Mm-hmm. Let's see. And anyways, um. You gain proficiency with the fo- with the following equipment, skills, defen- defenses, in addition to any provided by your ancestry and background: light armor, medium armor, and light shields. Okay, that's about what I'd expect. Martial proficiency with two weapon subtypes, and s- and simple proficiency in all other weapons. So you're good. You're good with most weapons. You're just bet. You're just better with two. You're just better with the ones you really like. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I can see you going spear and flail, monk, or maybe spear and crossbow. Just to continue with the whole crossbow thing. Um, I've done sword and spear before. Yeah, but that's a traditional wuxia pairing. Well, in that in that case, in that if in that case, why not um why not why not um mace and meteor hammer. <laughs> Aren't those the same subtype? <laughs> oh, media ha- meteor hammer is just a flail on steroids. <laughs> They're all smashy mashy is the point I'm trying to get across here. You yeah. you really stick to that bludgeoning damage. Hey, <clears throat> when all when all you have is a hammer, all your problems look like nails. 
Hi, hi. <laughs> and, um. <laughs> anyway, you are proficient in your intuition defense and in either your constitution defense or your dexterity defense, depending on your core abilities. If constitution is a core ability, you are proficient in your constitution defense. If dexterity is a core ability, you are proficient in your dexterity defense instead. If both abilities are a, co are a core ability for you, um, you're proficient in the defense corresponding to the higher of the two, and so on. We've seen this kind of thing before, although... Mm. Um, one small problem. Based on based on your core based on your core based on your core ability, shouldn't it be strength and dexterity instead of constitution dexterity? I was about to point out the same thing. I was also about to point out the a small part you skipped over. If neither are a core ability for you, you are proficient in the defense corresponding to the higher of the two, mm -hmm. implying because because I at first I thought where's the strength defense, but then. I saw that last part, implying that neither can be a core ability for you means you could still pick strength as a core ability and qualify for the class as per the strength slash dexterity requirement. But you could end up not having dex or con as your as your cores and still have to pick the higher of the two for the defense. Mm -hmm. So I think that's intentional. I think not having a strength defense is intentional. All right. Let's see. You gain for skills. You gain proficiency in investigation, persuasion, and arcana. About Which makes you sense. You gain proficiency in a ritual artistry of your choice. Apparently, initi initially, inquisitors were bound to the abjuration artistry, but this was too restrictive for me. Inquisitors are an intuition in class. They should be able to choose what specific flavor of ritual they know. So I opened it up. Good call. Player choice is usually really good, so the fa the fact that they get uh, proficiency in a ritual artistry of their choice is that the first time we've seen that, or I feel like we might have seen that before. I think we might have seen that with Druid. Let me check. Let me check. I am checking now. They get two ritual artistries. Yeah, yeah, we saw that. We saw. I, I was right. We saw that with Druids prior, and then. But but the Herald did not get that, even though the Herald is also a casting class. Mm -hmm. So getting proficiencies in artistries um, is, of course, not going to be guaranteed to all casting classes. Again, I really love this little, your proficiencies are even different thing. That's just really cool. Plus, you could get a ritual artistry um, proficiency from a background or an ancestry. So there, there, there are other places you could be getting these other things, but there are, there are also uh, drips of them here and there in the classes as well, and it's not the same between each, each and every class of a certain type. I really like that, because that's really... That's, that, that gives another layer of consideration to what type of character you want to play. Languages. Two languages. Ooh. Let's see. As an Inquisitor, you have a number of base vitality points equal to half your level plus your intuition modifier. Basically the same we've seen with almost all other classes. Half your level plus one of your uh, key, uh, core ability mods. Mm -hmm. Usually the core ability mod that is not strength dex. Yep. Then we get to raising the death flag. When an Inquisitor raises hearts. the death flag... They are instantly restored to full HP. Attacks against them have disadvantage, and they may choose secondary options up to their secondary effect limit without spe without expending spell points. What? <laughs> what the actual fuck? <laughs> so early you get what? If you're raising your death flag, you can just add all the secondary effects to your spell. All of them up to your limit. Mm -hmm. What? In addition, they may act twice in the initiative order rather than once and gain an extra reaction in the course of a round. Your Inquisitor is very, very determined to make sure that whatever they were following is going to die. And they will die trying. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> I just love uh, that, each the, that each of the death that each of the death flag. You remember you remember how um 
in le in level up, one of the one of the key things that we were going with was this ability is go this ability is uh, is good, but but bad for when you get it. Yeah. We're not having that problem here, especially with the de especially with the death flags and especially with the um, capstones. Yes, the capstones all feel really well well done, and uh, there was actually when when we did our our review of the herald previous, mm -hmm. um, and we thought that uh, the herald with the message of doom seemed kind of lackluster. Um, some of Tanner's notes did say, well, there's some stuff there that hasn't been exact specified in the way that it probably should be, and uh, then when we see the changes, uh, the he the message of Doom will be a lot better. Um, and it specifically has to do with how uh, the compelled status works. Hmm. And I think he's changed it by now, so let me... Just as an aside... The compelled status. Uh, when one creature compels another, they issue a command. Uh, some features which inflict compelled condition specify the command you're able to issue. At the beginning of the compelled creature's next turn, it may choose whether or not to follow the command or not. If it follows the command, it removes all severity of compel for that particular command. If it chooses not to follow the command, it still removes all severity of compelled for that particular command, but takes 1d6 psychic damage for each severity of the compelled condition removed. So, rather than it being, you know, left left to them making a choice and maybe taking damage um, based on based on the chance, it's no longer that way. They they are compelled. Period. They either take damage or do what you say. For that one, so so the message of doom is now much more powerful, especially that capstone. So, again, the point about capstones that are really good, they still exist. We 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 have we have the clarification needed for even what we've may have thought as a little lackluster in the previous episode to be much better now. <laughs> Oh my god, and I see why he revamped it before we got to Inquisitor already. <laughs> <laughs> so, starting, ge starting gear, you get two weapons of your choice, tier one armor of your choice, one adventuring kit of your choice, and one potion or poison of your choice. So, we, st so we start with first level features. And at the and right at the top is imperative judgment. You may place one of the following imperatives upon a creature you can see as a ten foot quick action. You must be able to speak, and your voice may, must be able to reach the creature, though it need though it need not be able to hear you or understand language for the imperative to take hold. You may only place an imperative on one creature at any given time, unless a class feature would say otherwise. Halt! You compel the creature to stop moving. It may not not utilize its movement during its turn. Cease. You compel the you compel the creature to cease any violent actions. It may not take the attack action during its turn. Come forth. You compel the creature to approach you. It must use whatever movement it has to get within your melee reach. Silence. You compel the creature to stop speaking or actively making sound. The sound of it moving does not provoke judgment. If the creature acts against one, against one of your imperatives, you may place a judgment upon it, sentencing it with the authority of your command and choosing from one of the following options. Compliance. You compel the target with another command. The severity of the condition is equal to your intuition modifier plus one with the initial compel, compel severity of, from the initial compel severity of the feature. Imprisonment. You hinder the target. The severity of the condition is equal to your intuition modifier. Death. You make the target vulnerable. Severity equal to your intuition. Enfeeblement. You weaken the target. Severity of the condition is equal to your intuition. Dev note. These features might seem overly powered, but keep in mind any creature is able to fight defensively. It's how I streamlined the system so I didn't have to keep, a l keep timers on a lot of features. I also might do this with the afflicted condition, but I haven't decided yet, as I would need to adjust a lot of features that afflict. So, 
Uh, I'd like to point out that in the blurb at the top of the Inquisitor profile here, both Come Forth and Death are capitalized. They're based off of this judgment system. So he inflicted Come Forth, and then the assassin did not come forth, so he inflicted Death, which, of course, gave him vulnerable. But I see the reason why he clarified the compelled condition prior to this. You inflict one of the severity of compel with any of these commands. And so they either do what you say, or you make a judgment. But that's not all. They either do what you say, or you inflict a judgment, and they take 1d6 psychic damage. Because it's one severity of compel. Mm -hmm. Which... Sir... So I think I think I think this gives us a bit of a, a bit of a key as to the niche that the Inquisitor is going to be is going to be fulfilling. Then we get to gaze. Oh, of field the... control. Yep. Then we get or to he's... gaze of the Inquisitor, not to be confused with gaze into the fist of dread. Not to be confused with penance stare. Mm -hmm. As an action, you may expend a vitality and open your awareness to detect powerful forces around. Until the end of your next turn, you know the location of any celestial, fiend, undead, and one other creature type of your choice within 60 feet of you that is not behind total cover. You may choose a different creature type each time you use this feature. If you choose humanoid, you, mu you may also choose a subtype, orokai, elf, dwarf, etc. You know the type, celestial, fiend, or undead, of any being whose presence you sense, but not its name or other such specific information. Within the same radius, you also detect the presence of any place or object that has been consecrated or desecrated, as with the Hallow Ritual. You may also use this feature on a specific creature you can see. If you do, you learn any of the reputations of that creature, if it has any, unless those reputations are hidden magically. I like the dev note. Mm -hmm. This feature is so... He says effing, but you know the, the monastery. This feature is so fucking cool for narrative purposes. It makes having an Inquisitor in your party really noticeable. Do we think this guy is lying to us? Inquisitor shifts his gaze to the man. He has a reputation as a coward and a swindler. Chances are he's lying to us. Mm -hmm. Does this fundamentally change how the party is able to gain information? Yes, and that's the point. The fighter fundamentally changes what is achievable in a fight. The Herald changes what is fundamentally achievable based on their archetype. The Druid changes what is fundamentally achievable with vitality. Every class in Heavens and Heresies fundamentally changes how the game can be played in a unique way. It's why I have a class system in the first place. It also forces both GM and players to interact with the world more. Enemies should be set, should set up rituals to hide their reputation slash guard them from divination, etc. If they have the means to do so. The BBEG should feel like a BBEG using the magical system that exists in the world to their advantage. The encounterary should also help GMs track this so it's not so it's not just an extra burden for them. Mm -hmm. And so that's the second first level uh, Inquisitor feature. And the third one is, well, spellcasting. Which the, which the rules, the rules for the rules for it, um, I think are largely the same with all, with all of the spellcasters. The only, with thing... one addition, go ahead. You may use a weapon as a spellcasting focus. Mm hmm. I don't think that's on every caster. Let's let's see. Is let's check. Let's check the let's check the druid. Um. Yeah, it doesn't say that under druid. Mm -hmm. and, and herald. I'm checking that now. It'll open. Uh no. Nope. So the spell casting rules are largely the same, but again. <laughs> A fundamental change, you may use a weapon as a spellcasting focus. Because that is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And that 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 alone is go is going to because of, especially since um a spell a spellcasting focus is significantly important, that's go that's going to further add to that gish fantasy. Yep. 
he he really did lean into making this his answer to Gish's. And uh, I'm here for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, Monk, how many times have I said, you know, I really want to play this class? Um, is, has it been every class so far? Yes. It's been every class so far, right? <laughs> yeah. I really want to play this class! <laughs> um, so... They ca- the Inquisitor starts with one spell known and caps out at four. Um, mm-hmm. His max spell points are, is going to range for, between two through eight. His recoverable spell points are going to range through two through five. And his secondary effect limit is going to range from one through five, which means a, t- a- imagine a 20th level Inquisitor raising the death flag. Every one of my spells uses as many effects to maximize their their potency and and damage and such as as possible, um, because you're gonna die. Um, I'd also like to point out there is one other difference mm-hmm. um, that we didn't point out. Uh, the whole at higher levels thing still says you know at fifth, eleventh, and seventeenth uh, you can add. One additional sec- uh, you can choose one additional secondary option each time you cast a spell without spending spell points. But, and here's the important part, you may only utilize this feature when you utilize a spell or, or utilize a weapon focus to cast a spell. So you have to use a weapon focus for your free secondary options. Which is why they're given so many maximum spell points, I see. Because if you aren't using your weapon focus, you have to use your spell points. Mm-hmm. I I really like this. I really like this. Let's see, at second level, you gain force. You gain at first foresight. On your turn, while threatened, you may utilize a ten foot quick action in order to have your GM reveal to you which actor will act next in the initiative order. If that actor is incapacitated during your turn, the GM will reveal to you which cre- which creature will act instead. You have, in addition, you have advantage on any intuition investigation check to glean information from a humanoid. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, especially and they get fighting styles. Yep. Nice. Let's see. So for for fighting styles, you get you get you get a choice of close quarters combat, counter fighting, great weapon fighting, positioning. Two weapon fighting and sharpshooter. Let me lo- let so me no, load up. Um, let me load up the just, fighter to see to see how that how that particular thing stacks up. Uh, fighter had like ten of them, eight of them, eight of them because we had to, because we, I was talking about getting all eight of the uh, stances. Mm-hmm. They have a uh, positioning and protection and shields maiden. So the the fighter the fighter gets more. Yes. Uh, protection. They get protection and shield and shield maiden slash shield bearer. Um, which which the inquisitor does not get. But uh, we we've covered the fighting styles before. Um, as a quick rundown, CQC. If you're in the stance, somebody uh, melee attacks you. Uh. They take bludgeoning damage equal to your class ability score. Great weapon fighting allows you to cleave, uh, it, cleave and also power attack with heavy weapons. Mm-hmm. Uh, positioning increases movement speed. Two weapon fighting. Um, two weapon fighting gets rid of some of the restrictions on holding two weapons. You don't have to use light weapons anymore for two weapon fighting. Uh, you get a, an extra bonus to your active defense, and you can draw or stow both weapons at the same time. Or two one-handed weapons at the same time. And then, of course, uh, Sharpshooter was the one where you could basically be a sniper. And you got uh, the equivalent... Uh, what's the equivalent of power attack for, for ranged attacks again? Um, precision attack. Yeah. Yeah, and so those are those are the the six stances or styles they get basically. Mm-hmm. And Bar- then of course barring third, of, barring of course anything that they might get from outside the class. 
outside the class or anything they get from any of their archetypes. But uh, this is one of the one of the uh, classes that gets a late archetype. Yep, they don't get they don't get it until th they don't get their archetype until third level. Mm hmm. But they also get but at third level they also get Eldritch Strike. When you channel a spell <laughs> through a weapon focus and choose to add damage with a secondary option, you may add your weapon's damage dice rather than a D4. And there is an interesting dev note here. <laughs> like I said, interesting. This is a big, huge deal. It means every spell point they channel into a spell could potentially give them a D12's worth of damage than a D4. It's why they get so few extra secondaries as compared to other people with spells. Their spell points are worth more in that sense. Again, every spellcaster should feel unique in how they utilize magic, even though all magic works in the same way. It's one of the reasons why the spell list isn't restricted by class. I don't need spell lists to make the classes feel unique from one another. Not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just not how this specific system is put together. Mm -hmm. I'd like to point out, they get three extra secondaries by, uh, by 17th level. That's um, that by itself, with Eldritch Strike. I'm just going to use three extra sec my three free secondaries. Uh, oh, and I'm wielding something that's a d12 and dice damage, so that's 3d12 extra damage. Because it doesn't say that you have to channel the spell using spell points, just that you choose to add damage with a secondary option. And they get free sec they get three free secondary options at 17th, only when they're using it as a spell channeled through a weapon focus. It's a synergy, and it's a really good one, and he's he's absolutely right. 3D12 is a big fucking deal. This also this also makes their raising the death flag even worse. <laughs> I'm going to channel all of my all of my spells to my maximum spell modifier through this weapon and hit you for 5d12 damage and you're just like oh oh no by the way that's a critical because the, the bard made it so oh no <laughs> uh. so anyway fifth level you get either a bonus spell or a mar or a mar or a martial feat, or rather bonus spell feat or bonus martial feat. I should I should clarify. And bonus spell casting feat. Oh my god. Those will be interesting. I am looking forward to when we get into feats, especially since this is since um when we get into feats, I I will have another opportunity to complain about to complain about why I why bad application of feats. In the in both thir in both third and fifth edition, um, chaps my ass. I mean, there are a lot of things in this world that chap your ass, monk. You have a library, multiple libraries, dedicated to it. Yes. But at at anyways, you get an additional feat from one of those two categories again at eleventh and seventeenth level. At 6th level, you gain plus 2 deflection against spell attacks, which is, in, which is, increased, to, by, which is increased by 2 at um, 14th and 20th level. And there's a little note here from Tanner that says, Deflection is the chance that an attack will automatically miss you. Oh. Might need to, might need to skip around to... To see to see if to see if that's to see if that's um to see if the full on rule for it is li is listed elsewhere. Defle deflection. Some equipment and features will grant a character deflection. For each point of deflection a character has, the chance to automatically miss them with an attack increases by one. It adds to the one through four. Oh. So, by twentieth level, uh, the chance to miss uh, uh, an an auto miss an inquisitor is half the die! Because it's plus 6 total, so it's 1 through 10 at that point is an auto-miss. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really go over deflection in other classes where we read it, and we didn't see this note until now, 
And I'm sure if this note had been earlier, we would have gone and looked at deflection earlier and then judged all those things that added deflection uh, a little more judiciously. And yes, I know judging things judiciously sounds like a tautology, but you're wrong. Mm -hmm. So so he goes, a, a lot more things are considered spell attacks in Heavens and Heresies, so this feature sees more use. A Dragon's Breath, for example, is made with a spell attack. I am perfectly fine with this. Dragon rolls a nine. <laughs> a dragon, a dragon missing with a breath weapon. A dragon rolls a nine, and you've got blood one through ten is auto miss. Your breath. It's a. Uh... I was feeling a bit chilly. Thank you. Uh, Although you could do with a mint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, at fifteenth level, you gain a you gain a bonus feat of any category, and at twentieth level, you gain limited magic immunity. The effects of your ritual the effects of rituals of tier four, very rare or below, do not affect you unless you are aware of them and consciously choose to be affected by them, and you cannot be subjected to the effects of curses unless they are legendary. 20 Inquisitor. Rituals just kind of bounce off you. <laughs> Unless someone is willing to go up that fucking mountain, kill that fucking dragon, and use its testicles for the for the legendary curse that they're going to use on you. Which um if if somebody has to go that far, you've um you've reached white death levels of infamy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're sending whole battalions to try and kill one guy. Mm hmm So then then we get to the archetypes. And he notes, unlike most other classes, the archetypes for Inquisitor very much determine their role. The Arbalest, for example, does not make for a very good melee combatant combatant. And this is one of the few classes I had to do this with, but it makes the class unique among others, in terms of its archetypes. Again, there are limited options for a few reasons. The core features generally fulfill the Inquisitor class fantasy. The feat options and flexibility allow for a lot of customization, and I only implement new archetypes if there, there is a missing class fantasy that a player brings to me that could be fulfilled by adding one. So, with that, with that in mind, we start with Arbalest training. Though magic, it, though magic is able to bend the will of reality, it is still bound by certain rules. A ball of fire can only reach so far. An arbalest knows this, using their range and positioning to nullify enemies that might, who might dare use magic against them. So the first thing you get is turret. Once on your turn, you may utilize a 10-foot quick action in order to increase the normal and extended range of your ranged weapon attacks by 15 feet and your thrown weapon attacks by 10 feet. This effect lasts until the beginning of your next turn and ends if you move after activating it. At 15th level, whenever you use this feature, each of your defenses increase by 2 until the beginning of your next turn. Dev note, features that extend your range extend both the base and extended range of a weapon. I'll add this into the notes somewhere, but for now it's here. Um, I'd like to point out uh, something about uh, Eldritch Strike and about the using a weapon as a, as a spell focus. It never specified melee. <laughs> Well, oh, looks like you got looks like you got your magic crossbowman. No monk. Do you know who this is? Do you know who this is? Who? This is <clears throat> He calls himself Kuzunoha Raiko when he's sent to an isekai in the light novel Tsukimichi. Because he makes a bow out of fire and shoots a giant ass fire spear out of it. <laughs> this right here, this is already yes, very much so yes. Holy shit, 
yes. Mm -hmm. you, you just you you make sure that one of your martial proficiencies is in the bow. You use the stance for uh, for sharpshooter so that you can use things at long range and you have no imposed disadvantage, and you ignore most cover, and uh, you can get the precision shot, and then you Eldritch Strike out. Oh my god. <laughs> ah! Okay. Anyway, at third level, you also gain sixth sense, perceive invisibility. When you attempt to sense or attack... When you attempt to sense or attack a hidden creature, you may ignore a severity of the hidden condition equal to your intuition modifier. This feature does not affect severity of the in of the hidden condition caused by cover. So not only nope. <laughs> so that's even more ignoring cover. Uh, well, no, it doesn't ignore cover. That's mm -hmm. what it's saying. Yeah, it's saying it doesn't affect the sever the severity th the severity of hidden. Yeah. But, which which means that they're still hidden to you mm -hmm. if they're behind cover. Or at least the severity stays the same. Yeah. However, you know that this makes our shadow jumping uh, disciple from earlier uh, able to be found by an Inquisitor real easy. Yeah. Huh. So, th then again, then again, um, the, 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 and again, uh, there seems there seems to be a whole lot of anti magic capa capacity when it comes to the Inquisitor. Mm hmm. Um. So ne next is at seventh level is reposition. When you take damage while threatened, you may expend a vitality and use your reaction in order to turn invisible and teleport up to thirty feet to an unoccupied space you can see. It's misty step. Yep. It's outright misty step. With added invisibility. Of course, if, of course. If you're t if you're taking damage and you're effectively a magic sniper, it's probably a good idea to get to get out of the to get out of the out of the line of sight of whoever's shooting at you, or stabbing you. Especially if they're stabbing you, because the vibe I get with the with the Arbalest training is that you should avoid close quarters <laughs> combat if you can. Well, from what I'm seeing with the Arbalest is, while they're not intended to be a melee user, there's nothing here that inhibits melee. So you have the okay melee of the base class, mm -hmm. just because you're already enhanced by things such as your fighting styles and the Eldritch Strike. <laughs> um, God, that, that ability. <laughs> but your... Your specialty, your core competency, the, your pièce de résistance, your raison d'être, is shooty, shooty, daka, daka. Mm -hmm. This would be combat. a great class for an orc. Mm -hmm. um, at tenth level, you gain eldritch sight. Hold on. As okay. part of seventh level, you also get ranged combatant, which just increases your range for thrown weapons by five feet and ranged weapons by ten feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, Eldritch Sight. If either if either magical or non-magical darkness would render something as hidden from you, you may ignore up to four severity of that condition. This feature stacks with other features that grant similar effects, like dark vision. Or your ability to perceive invisibility. Mm -hmm. Inci incidentally, dark vision gets ridiculously overused these days. Mm-hmm. It's better than bringing torches in most cases. That's why. At least to most people. Yeah. I use I use the torch as a one d four burning uh, weapon. I'm sorry. I'm dual wielding. <laughs> Burned. <laughs> it's an improvised weapon. No, it's not. It's a club with fire damage. Mm -hmm. And eight and at eighteenth level, you gain true shot. As long as you know the general position of an enemy and the path to that enemy is within your weapon's normal range, you may make your attack roll as normal against that enemy, even if the enemy is blocked by cover or out of sight. In addition, so, cover no longer provides benefits to your enemies against your ranged weapon attacks. 
so okay it's spell sniper but better additionally your ranged weapon attacks deal full damage rather than half damage even if you miss with them If you choose to deal full damage with a miss, you do not gain combat focus. It also doesn't impose any other effects, so it's like Eldritch Strike would not activate on a miss. Actually, you know, you know what Arbal you know what an Arbalest Inquisitor is. What would what would happen if what would happen if Cl if Clint Barton actually actually took magic training? <laughs> no, no monk. It's even worse than that. I will tell you exactly what an arbalest is. Go play Dragon's Dogma. Oh. Go play a magic <laughs> archer. Lie.exe not found. So. Oh, really? Dot JPG. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's resurrect a dead meme while we're at it. <laughs> so next is Imperator training. When magic goes awry, when wizards go rogue, when sorcerers become unhinged, when war... I, sh I, want, I want to say, when warlocks are still warlocks, <laughs> imperators are often the first and last to respond. An imperator is an unwavering force in the face of destructive magic, stalwart and unyielding. So, they gain two, they gain two features at third level. Aura of the Imperator... Rather than placing an imperative on a single creature, you may choose to place your imperative on creatures of your choice within 10 feet of you, which increases to 20 feet at 15th level. So I'm surrounded by guys. All of you shall halt! Mm -hmm. Or cease, if they're close enough to hit you. Yeah. And you also get shield and armor training. You gain proficiency with heavy armor, standard shields, and tower shields. If you had picked a feat or feature that granted you proficiency with with these, you may choose another feat or feature instead. I do like the fact that th that um, there is an out in, ca in case you end up accidentally double stacking. Um, I also love the fact that this gives uh, in an Imperator Inquisitor um, uh, proficiency in every type of armor and shield. I'm just going to be a guy in giant-ass plate mail with a tower shield and a mace. Bring it! At 7th level, you gain Training Regimen. You may assume two fighting styles from this, from this class at the same time, but must use a quick action at 10 feet for each fighting style you wish to switch. You also gain access to, the fall to three more fighting styles. Aetheric Aegis... Shieldsman slash shield maiden and protection. Protection and shields uh, shieldmen were two from fighter that they didn't have. Mm -hmm. Etheric aegis. I have no idea what that's going to be like. It'll be described below. But before that, at fifteenth level, you may assume three fighting styles rather than rather than two. No. <laughs> but yes. But no. <laughs> Etheric Aegis. As long as you have at least two remaining hit points, you gain temporary hit points equal to your intuition modifier plus half your level at the beginning of your turn. Is that the? Is this? You have to be low HP, or is this? You just have. If you have HP at two or higher, you get temp hit points equal to your int mod and half your level at the beginning of your turn every turn. I need this clarification because, um, if it is what I think it is. That is, you're just getting these temp HP re-upped on you every turn, so long as you have two actual HP or more. Um, there is literally no reason not to run this and something else with training regimen. Mm -hmm. Temp, <laughs> you are already a, Imperator is already looking to be a walking tank as it is. Yeah. Um. So. <laughs> Like, at level 15, you know, I might just run Etheric Aegis, Shieldman, and uh, Great Weapon Fight, or, yeah, Great Weapon Fighting. <laughs> uh, 
or maybe just a um, close quarters combat. Mm -hmm. Especially if, especially if your intuition is sufficiently high. Um. Well, and think about it this way: if you if you do close quarters combat and a theory aegis alone, um, you have temporary HP. You're going to take damage, but when they make a melee attack against you, they take bludgeoning damage equal to your class ability score modifier. So you you have the temp HP to soak that hit, and they take damage for hitting you. And you're probably wearing heavy armor or using a, a heavier type of shield than usual. I do think th I do think that there needs that there should be that there should be some sort of cap when it comes to the THP that you gain because the way this is written, you could as long as you've got high HP, you could keep gaining you could keep gaining temp HP. I think the temp HP just just re ups to whatever your int mod plus half your level is. I don't think it goes over that. But again, more clarification. Mm -hmm. So Tanner, here's our here's our first request, our first big request for clarification. If you're Aegis, please, we need some more clarification on that. Because otherwise, I could see that getting a little bit too useful. I could see that becoming abused. Yes. <laughs> Onward to the 10th level. Uh, impenetrable body. Y your physical defense is all increased by 2. Which is actually really useful. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's just, a, that's just a straight up... Yeah, here, 2 more to all your physical defenses. Really? Okay. Yep. Um, at, and at 18th level, you gain the Dread of Judgment. I was fucking kidding with that! <laughs> the dread of judgment. Don't think you can slip that by me and I wouldn't notice. And the tagline even says judge, jury, executioner. Tanner, if you even th if you even think about invoking the Stallone movie, I'm going to smack you. Anyway, your threat your threat range increases by 4 against creatures afflicted by your imperative or judgment. And keep in mind, that's multiple ones that you can inflict with that. Remember that your threat range starts at 20. This then makes... At, if you have no other feats that expand your threat range, and you very well could, if you're building this right, that means you've just turned a quarter of the die into a critical hit. And that means you've turned a fifth of the die into a guaranteed critical hit. Because 17 through 20 are auto hit. If you've expanded your threat range, they're also now critical. Mm -hmm. See. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> cease! None of us are going to cease. Okay, then I judge you it with death. What? <laughs> now you're all vulnerable, and which... <gasps> Oh my god! Oh my god! That's that's a stack of vulnerable equal to your intuition mod. What? No! <laughs> Hold on. Because <laughs> remember, vulnerable for each severity of the vulnerable condition on a creature, the threat range for attacks against it increases by one. So, if if you impose your your uh, <laughs> if you impose upon them and they say no, and you say uh, and you say okay, then die. Um, they and let's let's assume that at twentieth level you've done enough to get your in, your intuition mod to, to plus five. Mm -hmm. You have just you you've given them five stacks of vulnerable which increases your threat range against them by 5 they have another four stacks from the dread of judgment you've turned half the die into a critical hit <laughs> oh my god it's just like earlier with turning half the die into a into a miss, an auto miss, the spell resistance at level. Oh my god! <laughs> wow, 
what even is this? So the th- okay. the third and f- the third and final subclass we have for the Inquisitor is Arbiter Training. While an Imperator confronts magic directly and an Arbalist confronts magic from a distance. Sorry, Arb- Arbalist. Did I? S- yeah, I fucked. He up. said Arbalest. All right, never mind. An Arbiter is more cunning in their approach to magic and those who would pervert its use. An Arbiter can not only identify those with magical potential, but handle them with deadly efficiency. So at third level, you gain Skirmisher. So plus 10, plus 10 feet of movement. You gain a bonus to initiative equal to your proficiency mod. And you gain proficiency in Skullduggery. You also gain Sixth Sense True Form. You gain two tiers of expertise in the investigation skill and have advantage on ability checks made to discover whether or not a creature has magically changed its form or is hiding either its form or reputation with illusionary magics. Every Inquisitor is able to, is, is able to smell bullshit from a while away. Arbiters are able, to smell it for, are able to smell the bullshit and the bullshit under the bullshit. And they can do it from even further. Mm-hmm. Seventh level, seventh level features. First, we have we have Inquisitor, not Inquisitor, ex- Executor. You gain one tier of expertise in the Skullduggery skill and the Arcana skill. And when you kill a creature or knock one unconscious with an attack while threatened, you may turn invisible, making you hidden. The severity equal to your intuition. This feature may last for the encounter, but it ends if you attack. So, <laughs> hello, flank baiting and kill stealing. It's it's kill confirming, hmm. monk. Kill securing. <laughs> KS is kill secured, not kill steal. At 10th level, you gain gut feeling. You make intuition checks with advantage and you increase your intuition, I think, by two. It probably should say by two, but I I imagine yes, um, which means you automatically get plus one to to your uh, your mod. Mm-hmm. Well, assuming you're high enough. Yeah. There's little areas where two two of an of an a, a, a two ASL would not would not give you plus one to a mod. Mm-hmm. But they're few and far between. Yeah. And if you're taking this class, you are likely have already spec'd out your intuition anyway. <laughs> At eight, at eighteenth level, you gain Aether Hound. You are able to distinguish those that have magical abilities around you. Unless a creature is shielded by a tier five legendary ritual, you are able to tell if it has magical properties, what spells it has access to, and any rituals they may have performed in the last month. Your thoughts can't be read by telepathy or other means unless you allow it. You can present false thoughts by succeeding in a, on a spell at attack against the mind reader's intuition defense no matter what you say magic that would that would determine if you are telling the truth indicates you are being truthful if you so choose and you can't be compelled to tell the truth by magic and increase your intuition and one other core ability of your choice by two you're a sure say again you cut out I said, you're a fucking witcher! <laughs> yes, you, yes, you are, especially, especially given, especially given the, the, um, spell list can equally equate to sign use. I mean, witchers only use, like, five to six signs total. Mm-hmm. So, Geralt is an exception, not the rule. <laughs> And even even, uh, with the, even with that, okay, okay, okay. Using signs isn't isn't exactly accurate because a lot of those signs are used as to, are used as combat tools rather rather than so, rather than something you can really do some blasting with. Mm-hmm. And they are also used outside of combat for other things. Yeah. At least in the books. Um. <clears throat> uh. 
but I mean, it's also kind of in the name of this feature, Etherhound. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you have a gut feeling about stuff, and that you literally seek out magical beings that are in hiding and causing trouble. You're a fucking witcher. You're a fucking witcher. And god damn it, if I didn't see someone create a two a two weapon fighting character using Arbiter, it wouldn't be too soon. But I, the funny th- These capstones are fucking great. The funny thing is is that um as I mentioned before, one of the big problems that happens with Gish characters is the fact that even with the whole you can do you can do you you can do fighting and ca- and casting reasonably well that's still a very very wide net especially when you consider the width of spell use whereas this particular gish i feel i feel um i ac- i actually feel that describing the inquisitor as fulfilling the gish fantasy kind of does it a disservice yeah, it's praising with faint dams. The in, the Inquisitor is the Inquisitor is is very much an anti mage. All the magic resistance, all the all the anti against magical hidden being stuff. Yeah, um, the the role of the Inquisitor is to find somebody fucking around with magic and make them regret fucking around with magic. Because the Inquisitor will show you what it actually means to fuck around with magic. Now die. Yeah. The Arbalest <laughs> obviously is your mate is your mage sniper. Um, the Imperador. Um, I feel like I feel like the Imperador would fit right would fit right in with the Black Knight archetype. I will tell you who is an Imperator. His name is Alistair. He is the bastard son of Merrick, and he is a Grey Warden and Templar, or previous Templar. Yeah, pr- yeah pretty much. Legitimately. <laughs> the more I read, Imp- I read the Imperator, I'm like, oh my god, it is Alistair, the Templar, Grey Warden. <laughs> Heavy armor, eats your magic for breakfast, and fucks you right up. Mm-hmm. <sighs> and the ar- and the arbiter, as we dis- as we mentioned earlier, is uh, is a witcher. Remember to toss a coin. Oh, valley of plenty. <laughs> but that means we need to choose who's an arbalest. If we can so easily imagine fantasy characters that we know of mm. from pretty popular fantasy things uh, as these other two archetypes, what role is this magic sniper fulfilling uh, but still being an anti-mage as a magic sniper? You know, the smart ass in me wants to say Ray Hino. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm still going to go with uh, with Tsukimichi's main character. Um, mm-hmm. He does a lot of distance attacking. Like, he has a dagger. He does not use it very often. He's good at, at, um, at fist fighting. He doesn't really have to do that ever either. He tends to spell spam using basic level spells that are just so powerful because he has so much mad mana um to overwhelm his opponents and more often than not he doesn't even uh he doesn't even do the fighting his servants do mm-hmm. um i'd say i'd say the elf from dragon's crown would would fit would fit yeah i can see that fitting um man this one invokes a lot of a lot of them I mean, you could always say that this is a better arcane archer than anything D and D ever produced. Yeah, but th- yeah, but that's <laughs> low. That fruit is low. Is hanging so low, it's on the ground. Don't you mean it's fermented, and we could make some really good wine out of it? Yeah, or cider. Mm. Mm-hmm. Now I want some cider. I think I still got a few cans of strongbow in the fridge. <laughs> but 
I guess I guess my point is that all three of these he said he said that the that his whole thing about archetypes is that they play to fantasies that you that people wanted to play to. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they can, that these ones can invoke so strongly images of very specific fantasy characters and in some cases a lot of them especially with the arbiter or the uh, arbalest mm-hmm. uh, is indicative that he has gotten that power fantasy pretty much spot on and the key th- the key thing here is the is the is the fa- is the is getting the, is getting down pat the fa- the fantasy because most archetypes are are on, most archetypes in fantasy gaming are a power fantasy no matter no matter what certain grogs w- want to say that the w- that the true way to play is the, is the is the sl- is the slog which um th- which I, which to that f- which to that always f- always feels like um the frogs in the bucket Yep, a frog in the well who doesn't know the wider world. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I'm just look. I'm look. All, all I'm saying is that a lot of a lot of people I've I've seen um, who are who are in that grog camp um, play D and D and nothing else. I mean, and probably haven't probably haven't played much of anything else for most of their life. Not saying every single one of them is like that, but enough of them are. Yeah, it's a sad day. Oh. Until you remember that, then they insist that you're doing it wrong, and then you're like, "And I'm not so sad anymore." You can stick. You can stay stuck in your bucket. Um, I treat them the same. I treat them the same way. I treat the, I treat the people who romanticize certain eras in wrestling. Oh, so you leave them. You leave them in the disabled parking spots. Got it. I only do that because I can't put a boot on their car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh no i really like this 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 class the way it's been built from the ground up it is very clear that there isn't really an analog in the source material to use like there's nothing you could pull from D D fifth or even most earlier D D classes that would have or, or and editions that would have um that would have equated to this. You would have had to pick and choose. I mean, if we go back to 3.5, you would have had to pick and choose levels and feats to, to equal this. And then, of course, all of the grognards that min-max would have said that your build is subpar. I always told, told guys like that to sit and spin. Yeah, this is... This is the this is the reason why this is the reason why I why I've said that um, the feat setup in say third edition is full of traps. Granted, a good chunk of that is because of the attitude that Cook had at the time, but the but the fact of the matter is, in order to in order to do those kind of builds, I feel like I, I feel like I have to deep dive into the rabbit hole that is character optimization. Which don't get it wrong, I do that I do that anyways because I find it fun, but I but it shouldn't be a necessity. Yeah, it should be something you can optionally do to have fun, which you and I have optionally done to have fun. I mean, I just spitballed a few synergies here that you could definitely expand upon using everything else to try and create the most crit fishy crit fisher that ever crit fished. Yeah, but since since in a lot of these we've kept, we've ended up inadvertently creating a creating a creating a character out of each out of each, especially the whole. Um, Especially the whole dwarven, <laughs> the whole dwarven druid thing. The, the dwarf druid, yes. The key, th- the key thing that com- the key thing that comes to mind for me here, is, is the uh, it, is is uh, is us doing the is us doing the, not the Final Fantasy style Dark Knight, but just the just the Black Knight archetype of somebody of somebody in. And so many layers of armor, you can't even tell if there's a human under it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just for just for extra just for extra just for extra. Um, for for an, for an, for an extra bit for an extra bit of lulls, I would probably have it that despite the scary looking armor, they're actually a de- they're actually a decent guy because I always find the gentle giant archetype amusing. Gentle giants are a good archetype for a reason. 
you know. I think I think that he donned the black armor so that less people would run away and seek revenge. They would instead be too scared to run. Yeah, just the only downside is whenever he, whenever he has to go whenever he whenever he wants to go for, go for a dr go for a drink. Um cuz cuz when I when I say I'm going with the gentle giant I'm talk and and this being a big guy, I am I of course including something that is right within our particular wheelhouse of experience, tall guy problems. Ah, uh, yes. This is why he didn't get a helmet with horns. He knew that was going to be an issue. So he's, he, so if somebody was doing a comic of this character, they could easily have a running gag of him, um, br of him breaking ceilings or br or breaking the d the um the d the entrance way of things. Yeah, like like I said, he got a helmet without horns because he knew that was going to be an issue. He probably should have cu uh, cut back on the ornate pauldrons, though. He tends to cut through door jams. Mm -hmm. And incident incidentally, there, incidentally there is. There is one. There is one. One person in wrestling that I know who ha who has repeatedly had the tall guy problems kind of luck, and that that is Luke Gallows. He hits his head all the time. Even in some, even in things mundane like say, like say hitting your head on the on the on the on the top on the top of a on the top of a trunk when you're trying to get your bags. I hate that. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I hate that. He does. He does too. And he, what he hates even more is when people la is when people are laughing at him about it. At that point, I go, "Would you want me to laugh at you if you tripped and dropped your bag?" Oh, I remember. I remember him. I remember him telling a. I remember him telling a, sto him telling a sto story about how they're they're about to go work out some some gy some gym. I think somewhere in South Beach or something, and. He he goes to grab the bags, and then everybody and then both 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 Car both Carl and Styles hear, hear this loud bang. They look they look back and they see him they see him with just with a furious purple face cu cursing up a storm. This not this knot on his head, and Carl knew better, so, so he didn't so he didn't say anything. But he he's trying his best not to laugh, so he's turning to the side. While mm -hmm. while AJ is doing that is doing that southern belly laugh and making it worse. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <sighs> but I've I've. But I think I think you can easily have some comedy of oh, this of oh, this guy try, this guy walking into an inn and everybody ev everybody know everybody knows that he showed up because everybody hears this loud crash as. The as the top of the door frame ends up banging his helmet. Yep, even without the horns, because he's too tall, his head still hits the door frame. Yeah, but get but getting pa but getting pa getting past that. Oh, it would be um it would it would be um I know I know there would be the temptation to do the good old sword and board, but um. A particular strategy that is that is pretty effective that is not used as much but by by fighters when by fighters in my experience spear and spear and board yeah spears and shields are pretty common in uh history too so I mean mm -hmm. I could see I could see tower shi tower shield and spear mm -hmm. just gonna uh, advance forward and then poke you until you're dead. Yeah. And g given given the whole th given the whole thing with r with reach and some of the other thing some of the other things that are applic that are applicable, it makes it even better. Um, exactly. But I think it's I think it's safe to say that so f so far that's an, so far that's another banger on the on the list when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the classes here. Um, yeah. Um as I as I mentioned before some of the de some of the dev notes that are on that are on these documents I hope that they're in the final version. Yeah. I mean it not only shows his his uh design mentality as he was going through and his 
essentially the personality of the person creating this. But it, it helps to synergize things. And let's see, let's see what we let's see what we've got next week. A man who I hope will not face the lawful stupid problem. That's what we have next. Oh, next we've got the paladin. So this will be this will be and this will be a very good opportunity to talk about some of the many issues that the paladin has had over the years. Yes. And I'm hoping that again we do not get lawful stupid. I don't think we haven't we haven't seen much in the way of alignment. Period. So I think we're safe on that front. I know, but I have to. As snake bitten as Paladin has been by that particular issue, I have to keep my head on the swivel with Paladins. And true. And truth be told, there are there are other. As easy as it would be to fo to focus just on just on that, there are other issues that the paladin has had over the years that will that will likely be delving into. Indeed. And but that but that is a story for for another time. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody!